Hello, tech leaders. I'm Carol Palombini, psychologist and tech leadership coach, and this is my podcast, Tech Mind Insights. My mission is to be the change agent for tech leaders grappling with communication issues, imposter syndrome, burnout, and the complexity of the tech leadership roles. In this show, I interview leaders and consultants working in the tech space to provide you with real-world insights into the challenges of leadership. If you want to be part of this show or have questions you'd like me to ask my guests, send me an email or a DM on LinkedIn. All my contacts will be here on the description of this video or post. And today, my guest is, is Spencer Shaw. Spencer is a London-based CTO, CPTO, specializing in helping CEOs and founders scale high-growth SaaS ventures. Currently working in a VC-backed startup called QuickBus, which is focused on the digital transformation of the bus of bus travel across Africa with partners including Vodapay and First National Bank. His superpowers are the ability to grow high-performing and motivated teams, customer experience growth hacking, launching new products, creating robust and scalable tech, being a CTO with sales mindset, infosec and risk management, cost cutting, and developing developing streamlining. So Spencer, welcome to my podcast and thank you for agreeing to be my guest. One of the first things I want to talk to you today is one thing that got me really curious when we, we had our previous conversation. It's about this customer experience growth hack. So can you explain our audience, what do you mean by that? And how does it help you to break silos in IT teams? Okay, so many SaaS companies have problems with their product and they don't quite know where to start fixing them. And that's problems from a customer experience perspective. And the way tech can sometimes work is tech can operate in a silo and you can have a CTO and he can be in charge of the tech, but the tech is also the product in many startups and SaaSes. And if there's no head of product and it comes into tech and the CTO doesn't really realize that, then they have all these problems and they don't know where to start fixing them. Explain a little better of, of what does it means to have this growth hacking in the customer experience. And can you tell me about that, that example that you gave on the quick bus project? So as an example, which can happen, there's a problem on the website that may come from customer services saying customers have booked the ticket, but they haven't received the ticket and you can't recreate it. And everyone starts blaming everyone else. And that's quite a common scenario. And how do you fix it? So I do this thing called customer experience growth hacking, and it combines a number of disciplines that overcomes this problem. I mean, firstly, it, it, the first thing is to recognize whose responsibility is it? Is it a product problem, a tech problem? But as I say, when the product is tech, then it has to come under the CTO. So the CTO has to step up a bit here. Wearing an e-commerce kind of hat, you want to use some third-party insight tools, for example, Hotjar. And you also want to have a regular meeting at QuickBus. I, did, I do this once a week. And you bring in guys from the customer services team, guys from the e-commerce team, the front-end developer, and maybe a project manager and bring everyone together and start looking at the hot jar videos. Now there's a clever trick you can do, which is have an identifier in the query string. So you can know who the customer is not in a way that compromises any identity security, but it means that hot jar will identify where the problems are and you see customers getting confused. You can talk to customer services and say, look, this is the ID. Can you find out who it is? And they can then work out, actually, it was that customer. This is their problems. And the key thing is the CTO can bring all that together and look at things from a customer's perspective and from a product perspective. And I call that customer experience growth hacking. And it's very powerful. 
Wow, it seems amazing. And I can easily see here two important challenges that usually my clients uh, face, that's my CTO clients and tech leaders clients. The first is CTOs don't see other areas as their stakeholders. So this is one interesting thing that you that, that you brought, like you brought together a lot of departments. So just not breaking silos within tech teams. It's breaking silos with all other departments and understanding that when the product is, when you work with the product, is the solution, is the end of the, the business, then you have to, to acknowledge all these stakeholders as being part of your leadership umbrella. So what the first thing would be changing your mindset and understanding how large your role is. The second one that seems to me a little bit that you're talking about psychological safety. Because how can you make all these people, how can you put all these people in the same room and still they feel safe to, to, to speak up and to give ideas and not start that blaming game? So how do, how do you make this happen? How do you make people collaborate? So that's a problem that I think a lot of companies do have when things turn into a blame game. And often that will happen when the relationship between the developers or the employees is contractual and not collaborative. So contractual means you promised this, you didn't deliver it, basically. And everyone starts to blame. But I believe in a collaborative approach, which is, okay, it doesn't matter how we got here. It doesn't matter where the problems came from. The important thing is to move forward. No one will get into trouble. We just need to work out where we're at, where we want to get to, and how to get there. So it's more of a feed-forward mindset than a feedback mindset. Instead of trying to find what actually happened, is what we're going to do about it, how can we make sure that this doesn't happen again? Well, no, well kind of. It is important to find out why there was a problem but the nature of SaaS companies is most of them are new product developments and no one's out to to mess something up and everyone's working to tight deadlines and to pressure so it, it might be because a button's in the wrong place or something's not clear no one's to blame for that it's if it's part of the process that there's going to be these issues that need to be worked out and whilst I'm calling it customer experience growth hacking, and, that, and I think that's an accurate term, it really is part of the problem. Everyone should be doing this. You know, a CTO should be, all CTOs should bring together all the different people and see how people are using the product. Yes, the other day I read something about this, that it's an illusion to think that customers use your, your system the same way as developers use the system. And sometimes I wonder if the developers even use the system because there are some glitches <laughs> that I find like like a prime video, for instance. It just can't remember the episode I'm in. Never. It always brings me back to the to the last episode of, of season one. And I'm saying, what? Don't people use this? How, how come they are not annoyed by this? Can you explain how this, how this happens? Actually, you know, I, I've noticed that on Amazon as well. Netflix, I think, does it sometimes. You're watching a certain series and, and it reverts back to the previous season. It drives me mad, that. Yes, and, and that's what I mean. So w w what's happening there? Don't they use it? So it is this illusion that people are going to use the product the same way that you do that can sometimes create this misalignment. So what you're suggesting, as, as I understood, is putting everyone together, understanding various perspectives of, of experience. So there is not only one customer experience. So there are various customer experiences and you want to hack them all. The actual example you gave with Amazon is actually a very hard example because you're still watching what you want to watch. It's just a little bit annoying that you have to tweak it. And I just thinking top of my head here, the only way to get around that would be if someone was to talk to you and ask you your experience or maybe to watch enough people and to pick up a trend. Now, I actually think talking to you would be the best experience there. So at QuickBus, our customer services team would talk to the customers. 
we would call them up and see how your experience was and then get that feedback. So again, it's a very powerful way of doing things. And if you link that up with the videos, that's the essence of hacking. But I think in the larger companies, a developer would never do that. They couldn't do that. You couldn't have a developer contacting a customer directly. Customer services could, but it's going to feel very removed because it's going to end up being too data focused. It's going to end up being someone customer services that's in Amazon calling up someone and going, um, how was your experience rated one to five? How do you find this? How do you find that? They probably wouldn't just let them speak. And if they did let them speak, then they want to really quantify it. And I think things would get lost in the data. The CX growth hacking is more about communication. It's, it's small, lean teams communicating well. Yes, data is important. And a prerequisite of the customer experience growth hacking is to understand how long different problems take to get fixed and where the problems are from a data perspective, but it can't be too over-reliant on data. It needs to be, we talk to customers, find out what's wrong and take action. Sure, it's all about communication and empathy. So I can I can identify there some emotional intelligence skills. And the first one is empathy. So you need to empathize and to, and to put yourself in the customer's position. And with your, with your system, the way you do it, you actually can see how the, the customer is behaving and what problems they might have, right? Isn't yeah. that the, what, yeah. what do you call it? What was the name of the? Customer experience growth hacking. Oh, no, the, you, you mentioned something, uh, a system or an app that you use for that. Oh, Hotjar. Yeah, yeah. That's the one. So I thought it was super interesting because instead of data, you're actually communicating, you're actually having another source of information. So you can see their empathy clearly. So com improving communication will depend on, on creating this empathy and collaboration. And in this way, you work as an inspirational coach, uh, an inspirational leader for them as well, because you're inspiring them to collaborate, creating this the psychological safe environment. So the, the the goal of the leader to be able to create this level of understanding of the customer is to put everyone together, to make them empathize with each other and with, with the customers so you can have a good communication among them. I think the empathy is a key thing. And as a leader, it's really important to, to empathize with the, the guys in the team and to create a safe space. So my way of doing that often is to open up myself. So if someone says, how's your day? I'm not just going to say, yeah, great, fine. I'll say, I use more emotive language. Oh, it was amazing this happened. Or actually, I'm feeling a bit low. The kids are playing up. I'm feeling a bit sick. <laughs> but by sharing that, it means other people can share how they're feeling and what problems they're facing. Or when it comes to work, for example, a work rate issue might be, oh, yeah, I'm really stressed out by the volume of work, but I'm confident we'll get through it. I don't want to put people into a negative mindset by being negative, but by expressing the frustration, either personal or business, it gets out there and then other people will be more real and it creates a safe space. Yeah, yeah. It's creating the safe space where people can be themselves, right? When they don't have to be interpreting a per character. Yeah. So... Another, so you mentioned a lot about communications, and I wanted to tell me what are the most common communications issues you find in your career, in your experience, and you mentioned something about hiding behind the agile methodology, and I so, think our viewers are, will be very interested in that. So this is controversial, mm. and but I this is why I think to be the case that a lot of developers and dev teams will just hide behind some elements of scrum or not so much agile more scrum or some tooling set and it's almost it's almost become a norm that they do that recently i was reading a book on being a cto and in that book it talked about different tooling sets one of them being slack it recommended teams to use tools like Slack. 
Now, in my experience, if I start using those tools, all productivity, well, not all, a lot of productivity will just slip away because you, you can hide behind notifications. Oh, I didn't get the notification. Please put it on Slack. And then you can't, your excuse for anything is I didn't get the notification. So then you, then you have to have meetings about the Slack and about the notifications and have you seen this and have you seen that. And then if anything happens at certain times, then people have turned off their notifications, which yes, that leads to quality of life to some extent because people want to have work-life balance. But when you have people in different countries and the agreement is that they'll work to UK hours or European hours, et cetera, but then a Slack turns those notifications off or if, for example, you send um, a message and they've got Slack open on a desktop or on the phone and they don't get the notification, there's so many ways they can just blame the tech for something not, not happening that it becomes an excuse. That's true. And there's also this, this superficiality in conversations most of the time. Yeah. The other day I was hosting a group coaching for a company about the stand-up meetings. And stand up, why were they doing stand up meetings with a question? Because they all felt that it could have been an email. And the goal of the session was how can you use that to create connection? Because it's more about sending information. If, of course, if the goal was just to send information, it could have been an email. But I think that what you mean is also that hiding behind from hiding behind these agile methods means that you are avoiding having deeper conversations. And tech leaders, they are really shy. They are data driven. They kind of don't prefer to avoid deeper conversations, longer conversations, so it can be annoying for them. So I understand how it can be attempting to hide behind this kind of superficial, super objective communication. You're right. Yeah, no, I, th I think you're right on that. People people can do that with with, with the hiding as well. Um, the, the daily stand-ups is, is an interesting one. Sometimes I do them, sometimes I don't. I think sometimes they turn into a are you at work today call. And it seems like you're being quite micromanaging. I, I a, a daily check-in, and that can be via, I like WhatsApp or Telegram or something, um, instant message, just, you know, the person's working on something, they're alive. I don't think everything needs to be a daily stand-up, proper meeting, formal, in the middle of a day. And for people who don't work in the UK or in a Western country, if they're in India or Africa and the internet's not always great or they've got other responsibilities, it's sometimes very hard to commit to the same time every day for conversation, which doesn't really produce very much. Yes, in the end, is asking what I am doing this for. What is the goal? And am I reaching the goal? It's not just about checking that responsibility. It's okay, stand up meeting, check, I've done yeah. it. So yeah. did you actually get what you wanted from those meetings? Not just the information, but the connection. Yeah. Did you have the opportunity to check in with their energy levels? How they are feeling, if they're feeling up to the next challenge, if they need a break, so I think that most leaders miss a lot of, of opportunities of developing their teams and retaining talents by not checking in with them on dailies, checking in beyond the information, beyond yeah. those three questions. So there's much more to get than information from meetings, right? I mean, my approach to that would be a voice note saying, hey, how are you doing? Just checking in house things, everything okay at home, you know, just having a catch up. I might send that as a voice note or do a, a regular one-to-one -one for more, for a bigger catch up. But I, I'm, I'm quite well known for informal voice notes just to say hi. Oh, that's a, that's a good idea indeed, indeed. So I like this tip. So the tip here is just check in with a voice message. And I like the idea of the voice message because you can be clear in your emotions. One of the yeah. things that chats 
a lack are emotions. It's hardly, in Brazil, people use a lot of emojis because people are very emotional. But I can see that in Europe, for, for instance, people don't use that much emojis on, on, on professional communication. And sometimes they are necessary just to say if that's something urgent or that's something I'm just checking in. And the, those super objective messages sometimes can be interpreted as being rude. Well, uh, emo I think emojis are brilliant. I think emojis are a sign that you care because you're taking extra time and effort to convey the emotion within the message. That's true. And, that's true. It should and be they're really important. important. Do you use it? Pardon? Do you use the emojis in your messages? I use a lot of emojis. So if if I'm asking someone to do something, I'll normally do that that prayer emoji. Like, please, can you fix this prayer emoji? So it's the extra effort takes away the command. And it shows you're grateful. You're putting more time and effort into it. Yes, that's Spencer. So for the next question, I want to know how you handle some conflicts within between CTOs and CPOs. You mentioned to me something about the blame game. Can you explain to me what that is? It relates a little bit to the customer experience growth hacking stuff, but when you've got, if you're in a SaaS startup and the tech is the product, and then there's a problem with the product, does that come under the tech guy or does it come under the product guy? If there is a product person, and sometimes they can start to blame each other. The product guy might say, it doesn't work because the tech hasn't done this right. And the tech guys might go, well, it doesn't work because you haven't designed the product right or you didn't tell us what you want. And I think the secret here is really to have a CTPO or sometimes called a CPTO. Is that someone who's in charge of tech and the product? And if you have one person who's in charge of both, and it's especially important in the smaller teams, one person in charge of both, then they get the bigger picture. They can see the product, they can see the tech, and there is no blame. It's just, okay, this is the situation, how do we move forward? I think anything to do with blame comes down to, no, it's not about punishing someone, it's about moving forward. Everything's moving forward, moving forward. Thank you. I love that. So again, you have to be empathetic to understand the other the other side, and you have to have conflict management skills, right? Because otherwise, how are you going to you're going to take things too personally, and you're going to be offended by that other person saying that they probably don't agree with something, or they probably think that the problem is in your area. And this about your area and my area, I think the, it, it's the base of a lot of conflict. So if you have one c-lab executive for both for the tech and the product or if you have this mindset that everything is one single product everyone is working together then you're not going to fall into this trap of blaming someone else because it doesn't take you anywhere right it's, it's, it doesn't take you forward yeah and this being a successful tech leader is all about moving forward it's not about blame yeah that's true so the last questions I, I have for you is an advice for developers who want to take a leadership path. Imagine this is a, someone come up, comes up to you and say, okay, so I got my first leadership role in my life. What advice would you give them? My advice is really to find a mentor, if possible, someone within the company who can advise them if they haven't got that, then try and find someone without the company, outside the company you can help. I, I've seen on LinkedIn, a lot of people, no, not a lot of people. I've seen some, some people advertising themselves as a CTO coach and they'll help new developers stepping into that role, speak the language of business as opposed to the language of tech. I was never fortunate enough to have the budget to pay for someone like that or, or the company to pay for someone for myself stepping up was a case of um, finding people in my personal network who I could go to with certain challenges. You're right. There's, there's research showing that having mentors can really advance your career. And I have mentors on, of my own. It's super important for me, for my business, and for not only for my coaching practice, but also for business as an entrepreneur. So it's 
a very good development strategy. And some people don't actually see this as a development strategy. And it is. And I think it's the fast track. Getting a coach or getting a mentor is a fast track for your for your performance in, in a leadership role. It, it, since you're going to have to change your mindset radically from that problem solver, the coder, to a leader, to taking responsibilities for other people or other people's work for the first time. And it, this can be harder than it seems. The hardest thing is the realization that you don't need to be the smartest person in the room and you shouldn't be the smartest person in the room, really. The CTO is the best people manager and relates the needs of the business to the needs of the tech. I mean, making sure that the tech supports the business. But it's, most CTOs won't actively code in the business. They won't have time to. And that means they're not hands-on which means that someone in their team will know more about a specific area than they will do because they're just not hands-on. So they are, by definition, no longer the smartest person in the room. There will be a, perhaps a small, small time when they move from developer to leader and they've got that hands-on development experience and they're doing leadership skills where they're this superhuman of doing everything. But it doesn't last forever because six months, a year down the line, their skills are now out of date. There's new technology that they haven't had a time to get into and someone else does. So they aren't the smartest. They have to get used to not being the smartest, but they have to be the best at getting the best out of people. Yeah. So you have to change your mission, your goal, have to change the understanding of your purpose in that in that company and also let go of your ego right it's some part of you have to die that that per, <laughs> that part of you you know, you know die is too strong of course but you have to let go instead of of taking of stepping up to a new kind of knowledge instead of focusing too much on tech you're going to have to focus on studying people understanding how people work understanding how to lead them and this this shift uh, uh, can be painful and I've seen a lot of people struggling with that. So Spencer, now that we are approaching the end of the podcast, I would like you to give our audience a book or a podcast recommendation. So what do you recommend them so they can keep on developing their leadership skills? You know, there's a great book that I read. It sounds like a joke book, but actually it's really good. <laughs> and it's called how to appear smart in meetings and it's it's a bit of a picture book actually but it just goes through meetings in the office and what to do or to say just to look smart and I, when, I, when I read this book it's, it's quite a short book it's, very, it's a very quick read but when I read it I remember thinking actually that's very clever and I do that already and I didn't realize that was a trick you do I just naturally did it and when someone is stepping up into a leadership role, sometimes they just have to look the part, but they're nervous or there's pressure on them. And there's a lot of silly mistakes you can make in meetings. And that book, How to Appear Smart in Meetings, actually just gives a few hints and tips just to give you that local leverage in a meeting and give you that, oh, what's the word, that feeling of, important no not important that oh what's the word comfortable, like, maybe. you're more comfortable with this more com thing. yeah more comfortable with the leadership role yeah i think it's kind of a, a creates a safe path so if you if you go with in this path since you don't know how to behave follow this as a first step yeah that because you won't fail so <laughs> stick to this and once you're, you're more comfortable with the role you can have your own style and adjust and change things here and there I, I, there's a whole section in the book on how to enter a room and how to network and and how you should go walk here first, talk to this person, then go over here. And it's a bit contrived and it, it's, it's said with tongue in cheek, but actually there's a lot of truth to it. And there's some good ones about if you're in, if you're watching slides, for example, you're watching a presentation, you should say, oh, just go back to the previous slide. I didn't quite catch that. And that shows you're engaging and it looks like you're very detailed and really on the ball. 
Now, I would normally do that naturally, but now I've seen it in the book, I realise actually that's a very clever way of seeming like you're 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 Being following offensive. everything. Yeah. <laughs> you're on top of everything. So so, it, so useful if you're naturally good like me. <laughs> I'm paying attention, but if you're not, and you just need to give that illusion, there's some clever tricks in the book. And work on developing that uh, on the side, right? So if you're not good at listening, you just had to ask to, for the person to yeah. rewind the, the, the slide, to go back one slide, maybe it's a good reminder that you should be paying more attention and work on your attention skills. <laughs> it also gives you where you should focus. That's good. So Spencer, thank you very much for this and if people want to find you and connect with you how can they do that what are your contacts best thing is linkedin spencer j shaw on linkedin and my profile will come up under a company called quick bus so thank you spencer for this conversation and for all this amazing insight in your experience and if you found this conversation interesting please consider sharing it and if you're feeling stuck in your leadership career or want to improve your leadership skills, book a chat and let's talk. Just click on the link I included in the post and on the video description, and I'll see you there or in the next episode of Tech Minds Insights. Bye.